Welcome to another episode of Thoughts of a Trillionaire and Becoming a Techno Wizard. Once again, um, let's see if I can keep this one short. <laughs> I realized I said that last time, it was a, ended up being almost an hour, but uh, let's try this again. It's going to be more of a lightning round. I have a whole lot of topics I want to get through. Um, I also realized I didn't talk, <laughs> didn't talk about the whole point of like the beginning of the last video, which I think I said about... Um, what can we transfer over from those times and how can we you know uh, transfer over the hunter gatherer good good stuff from hunter gatherer cultures into our current uh culture and, and environment um so i want to talk about that i want to talk about emergent intelligence cryptocurrency war the necessity of scarcity and competition um spirituality mental models data um and the price of growth so it's a lot of stuff had a had, have very, very short notes just to keep me on, on point. But let's start with um, these hunter-gatherer culture stuff. The main things I do want to bring over from those cultures that we know is highly successful because of 150,000 years of history um, and 2 million years before that, if you want to count Homo erectus, but uh, the, um, the egalitarian nature of their society. So we already know that's a very su successful organization structure, egalitarianism, where everybody has the equal amount of rights, amount of resources, and amount of um, positioning or, or opportunities, right? Even though you can, even in an egalitarian system, you can have strict roles. Like you can have people um, that specialize, right? I think that's important to note. We did have specialization before, you know, modern day kind of society and those hunter gatherer cultures, they specialize it. There was, you know, typically males were the hunters and typically females um, gathered, but in places where there was more fertility in the, uh, the environment, like more um, things to gather, um, a lot of men also gathered as well. So there was some cross reference in there, um, cross Trent, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, cross skilling. At the same time, there was also specific roles for people who, for instance, made bows and arrows, made tools. Um, there were people who who cooked more often than other folks, like elderly people. They, they they didn't, they weren't really able to go out of the camp very much. You know, once you get above a certain level, a certain age, so they typically stayed in the camp to um, cook, uh, clean, um, stuff like that, right? And uh, respect was given according to your experience. So once again, elderly people did tend to have more experience, more respect, but that did not mean that younger people were just meant to shut up, right? Shut up and listen. It was, it was well regarded in a lot of these cultures where the younger people were still able to be independent, where they had an idea of, oh, I want to go here, I want to do this, and they can do that. Right? There's nobody to tell them, no, you can't do that. It was, it was a discussion of, okay, I want to go here. Oh, uh, we think, you know, or maybe some elder thinks that's not a good place to go. And they're like, I want to go there anyways. <laughs> so maybe they probably did it. And I, 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 yes, a lot, this, this exact kind of conversation is like, you know, theoretical, but based on the archaeological studies, we don't really see very much... Um, very much violence, like internal violence between, you know, these different peoples. Uh, there are, of course, some violence, but is far, far, far less than in agricultural societies where you had an elite class and, you know, the workers or the people below them. And there was, there was in almost every single one of these societies where you have elitism, you always, it almost always ends in some sort of bloodshed and some sort of you know, battle, war, or anything like that, right? This, this, that we can see clearly in the, in the data, in the, in the history. And when in the modern day cultures of hunter-gatherer cultures that still are surviving today, um, they see the same thing where, you know, you have youths who are individualistic, who are able to do their own things, and they have a discussion with um, the elders and stuff like that. But it's not like contentious. Right, it's it's a it's a discussion they have, and it's an equal um, 
sharing of information and knowledge and stuff like that. So I think that is something we can definitely bring over. There's no reason why we can't have that today. It's just that in our current society, we arbitrarily, you know, kind of say, oh, if you're older, you're wiser. But that's not, we all know that's not necessarily true. Or we say things like, you know, um, or really the biggest problem with today's society is that we have, we have elitism. We have this nascent inclusion of, of more power, more resources, and more um, um, respect, right? Undue respect. Like it has nothing to do with how much merit, like your actual merit, how much you've actually accomplished. It has more to do with your network. It has more to do with the associated the, the, the assumed attributions of achievement. And I think that's a very important to realize is that you have somebody that's older or that's, you know, that's been in a company for a long time or whatever, right? And they, a lot of, to, a lot of times people assume that they've, you know, accomplished certain things that they've um, helped with the, with the company or whatever, right? And a lot of those times, you know, that that can be false. And I'm not trying to go against people who are more experienced just because I'm younger or anything like that. I highly respect people with experience and, and things like that. But we have to realize that we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot where you have people who are older and um, or who are more likely more connected. Right. And they're assumed to have to be more experienced when in actuality, they could be people who are just as old or just as experienced and they're not respected because they don't have the, the same connections or the same money, the same resources. Right. That's the problem. So I'm not saying that we can't respect people with experience. I'm saying that we need to respect people with actual experience rather than with networking, rather than looking at, you know, how many people they know or, you know, um, just how long they've been there rather than, you know, what they've actually done there instead of looking at how much money they have or what their status is, you know, what their, what their, uh, how many ribbons they have. I don't know, whatever, right. There's a, a bunch of these, these issues here. The point is that in an, in an egalitarian society, just because you are older doesn't necessarily mean you have more um, voting power than other people, than, than younger people. And that's very important. I think that's another thing that's difficult for some people to realize is that, you know, we have this idea that if you're older, if you have more experience, you should have more voting power in certain, you know, circumstances. Um, but that idea, even though it seems logical, it is not because you have a bias, right? You have a bias of what, of how things were done rather than, you know, how it is, how it is able to, you have a bias towards how things are done rather than how things are doing things right, basically, right? Um, where the, 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 the traditional way is thought to be the right way rather than if it's still the right way. You, you get what I'm saying? I'm not, sure, I'm not sure if I'm explaining that well enough, but um, I'll probably have to go into it more later on as I think about it. This is what I like doing is because I, I like to, you know, think about things as I go and hopefully other people listening to this can kind of hear and see my process of thinking and hopefully sharing that themselves hopefully. <laughs> um, but anyways, yeah, I do think experienced people do have far more value than this, than is currently given. But I think it's a it's a it's a thing of um, if, let me see if I can visualize this. So I think experienced people have an intrinsic value have an intrinsic influence on the voting so for instance if you're if you're voting on you know what decision to make where to go um so on and so forth that experienced person has wisdom and they can they should because of that wisdom they should be able to logically explain why we should do something right it's in it's intrinsic however on the other side a younger person who may not have you know that that level of experience they might be able to you know talk about the 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 adaptations the new things that are going on 
what has changed, right? And both of these are very valuable. However, in today's society, we, we have it such that the experience, a lot of experienced people who may not actually be properly experienced, who may not actually have the, the merit, right, of that experience, they, they are simply more connected or have just been there a while or whatever, right? They may not actually be able to logically explain why something is, should be done. And so they lean on their, their higher status, their elitism, their elite status. And that is illogical, right? Because it, it creates a, a, a difference. Um, you, ever, you, you may have heard, you know, the hippo, the highest paid person in the room or the, high, the, the highest influenced person in the room, right? That is the bias I'm trying to get to here is the fact that just because you're experienced doesn't mean you, you are like merit, like it's based on merit. And that's what we need to understand today. And a lot of our organizations and a lot of our political systems, the older person, the more experienced person is not necessarily the smartest or the most mer meritocratic or, you know, the more, the more logical person. And that is a problem. Likewise, likewise, the younger side, there's also an issue with younger people who, who are arrogant, who think they are more experienced than they actually are. And so when they're given too much power, when they're given too much, you know, say, too much weight in the, uh, the decision-making process, then they also become illogical. They also skew the process, skew the, the ability to make rational decisions. So that's why I think egalitarian is all, always super important because whether you're young or old, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. You shouldn't have a weight on the decision-making process. Older person should not be given more credence, more voting power, just because they have more experience. If they truly are more experienced, then it should be able to explain and convince other people to go a certain way to make a certain decision. That's the whole point of being experienced is that you can explain to people why this works based on data, based on, um, based on the, the, the process, this, that, and the other, right? Based on wisdom. And if you're younger, you, you shouldn't be over there talking about, oh, this is the best way to do it without any sort of data. Your job of the younger person, of the person that's new to the business or the organization, is to point out the, the things that have changed or the things that don't really make sense based on their new, fresh, you know, insight. You know, I've experienced myself coming into an organization where I'm the new person, right? I can't tell people what to do because I have no experience there. All I can tell people is what I, what I see, you know, and that's what I did, you know, when I, when I was working at the arcade, I audited, I audited the entire operation. I was like, okay, I'm learning this from this person, this from this person, blah, blah, blah. And, oh, I noticed that th this person says this thing, but this person says another thing. That doesn't really make sense. So I, I bring it to the team. I was like, okay, we have two different, you know, ways of doing this. Which way is the right way? Which way should we do about it, go about it? You know, and that sort of thing is actually valuable. And that's where I think a, a lot of younger people uh, make a mistake is because they think they they need to quickly get experience and quickly, you know, be able to tell people what to do and, and all that all the other stuff to gain influence. That's not the game you should be playing. The game you should be playing is how can I share my fresh insights? And then on the other side, once again, the older person the, or the more experienced person needs to be talking about, needs to be able to share their wisdom and share you know, the data. So yeah, I hope that made sense. <laughs> but egalitarianism, I think that's a huge, huge aspect of what we need, we, what we need to and can bring inside of today's system. There's no reason why we cannot have purely egalitarian organizations, right? People like to assume um, you need some sort of hierarchy in order to make decisions. But in actuality, whenever you have hierarchy, you create distance between, um, you create inefficient communications because you create distance between the person that's making the decisions and the person that's actually carrying that thing out. Right. If the person is making the decisions is looking at this, that and the other and telling them to do this. But the person that has to carry it out is all the way down there and has to hear through the telephone system or whatever of this person. The manager tells the manager tells the other manager tells this person to do that. It's just highly inefficient. 
right? Yeah, sure, it works, but that doesn't mean it's the best way of doing things, right? And we have, once again, 100,000 years, 250,000, 200,000 years of history to show that's that, that other way, the egalitarian way is more successful because they had more, they had societies that were more stable over, over a longer period of time, right? Over the last 10,000 years where we've had hierarchical systems, we've had what? More war, more battles, more bloodshed, more violence, more greed, more, so it's, it's like, what? You, the, only, the only things that really comes from hierarchy is the ability to scale, right? But once again, you have to ask yourself, is this a good ability? And this is going to, you know, what the last things I wanted to talk about, which was the price of growth. If you scale, whenever you scale to a certain level, right, it, it, it requires a different way of doing things. I, I do admit that. And I'm not, this is more of a question rather than a, a oh, I think we should do this or I think we should do that. The question I, I want to put forth is, what are the full cost of growth? Like in terms of, if we had to make a spreadsheet, if we had to make a pros and cons list, a SWOT analysis or whatever, right? Of everything that, that we have been able to accomplish, quote unquote, accomplish with growth, with the, with the ability to scale things beyond 20 and 50, 50, 50 people organizations. Cause that's, that's a, that's a um, major life hack or <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Major organizational structure is the fact that hunter gatherer cultures only had only allowed themselves to have 20 to 50 people per band per group. If there was more people, they could split off into their own group. Right. It was, it was kind of fractionalized like that. It was, uh, but when we started having agricultural societies that allowed a whole lot of people to come together, and that sounds like a good thing. It sounds really good, right? But then if you also bring in the cost of that, the fact that it also brought in an inequality, the, the fact that it also brought in things like greed and, and higher levels of violence, higher levels of disease, higher levels of inefficiency, in the system and the decision-making process, then you have to wonder, is that really a good cost? We, uh, it's so easy to, to think it is a good cost because our entire lives are structured like that nowadays. But again, it's only 10,000 years. It seems like a lot, but it's not. 10,000 years is just a fraction of 150,000, 200,000, 2 million years before that. So you really have to look at this, you know, you, I really want to see somebody, maybe I might do it if I had some time is to sit down and write down, you know, the, the, <laughs> the cost and the, the pros and cons of everything we've done in agricultural societies, like everything we've accomplished in the last 10,000 years and everything we, we did for the last 150,000 years or longer and try to see, you know, what are the pros and cons to that? Like, it seems obvious. It seems like, oh, we made so much money the last, you know, 10,000 years. We made so much progress. We were able to go to the moon. But the only reason why we ascribe value to the, all of that stuff is because we're indoctrinated into believing that it's a good thing. If you were born in a society where, um, oh, let's take a very obvious one, okay? Slavery, <laughs> Okay. Slavery was a really bad system, and it and was very. It was something they used for a very long time. Once again, there were two different types of, types of slavery, at least, right? The main kind of general areas of slavery. There was a slavery for prisoners of war. That was the that was kind of like one of the first use cases of why you had slavery, is because when you, um, um, when you oh my gosh, invaded <laughs> another place and took their stuff, right? That was the whole point of, you know, war and all that other stuff to so take their things. You didn't really want to kill everybody. It, it's very inefficient to kill everybody and, it, and it's more energy. It's, it wastes, it, like it's a Pyrrhic victory if you had to try to kill everybody in that, that, that whole group. And we're still human. We don't want to kill all the women, the babies, right? We don't want to kill all the, the young boys and all this stuff, right? Um, or, or the old people, right? It's, it's, we still, even in war and battle, it shows you the fact that we even have like 
art of war and rules of warfare shows that we're not like inherently evil creatures. Like that's another thing that I think is very important to realize is that if we were just violent creatures, if we just wanted to kill blah blah, like how certain people like to are are like to villainize humans in general, then we would be more like ants or spiders where they just eat anything, right? Any any other spider, they just eat that thing. It's, it's gone, right? It, it doesn't matter how young, old, male, female, it doesn't matter. They eat the thing, right? Same thing with ants. If they, they see, you see another ant from another um, another colony, you, you go to war, you kill all of them. Every single one, it's, it's genocide every time <laughs> as, as much as they can get away with, right? So, but with humans, we're able to be self-aware. We see another human, and we, we, we have to justify fighting them. We have to justify the violence, right? And so when you go to war and you fight somebody, you take over their stuff, you have a whole lot of people that's still surviving on the other side, the enemy side. And what are you going to do with them, right? You can't just let them, if you just let them be, they're probably going to come back and fight you or later on or whatever, right? It's a period victory. You don't want that. You don't want to have to go to violence, violence, violence. Everybody dies and then what? And nobody can use this stuff. So that's why slavery was invented, right? You, you, where, you're, where you're bringing these people into your culture. You're trying to make these people a part of your people, but they don't want to be your people. So you enslave them. You say you have no rights. You have no voting rights. You have whatever. Um, and we tell, we, we give you this, we give you that and, and, and so on and so forth. However, it is important to realize that in a lot of places, in most of human society, most of human history, slaves were still humans. Like they didn't dehumanize people. Slaves were just other humans who lost, right? And you tried to get them into your culture. And so over time, these people would become part of your culture. And they would, you know, that that's it's it's a, it's a genius kind of thing if you think about it, right? <laughs> um, very efficient way of using, you know, prisoners of war and so on and so forth. And that was a way of doing things for a long time. Um, I said this before in the last video, but they the Mali people, for instance, they made a constitution where they said, you know, you are the master of the slave, but you are not the rock on their neck, right? You don't you can you own them, but you don't like you don't want to be the the burden on their back. You don't want to you don't want to abuse them and so on and so forth. There were rules against abusing your slaves. But in America, <laughs> in the Americas, in the transatlantic slave trade, that had to do with a lot more than just prisoners of war. That had to do with, oh, we want to, you know, colonize this area. And it had to do with supremacy, it had to do with a lot of things that created this idea that you wanted to dehumanize people, where these people were not human, were less than human. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is growth. They wanted to grow, they wanted to go to this new place and become self sufficient so that they can, you know, separate from the, the British rule, right? Or they can be self-sufficient in this new land where they had no infrastructure before. You know, these people coming from Spain, from England, from um, Dutch, whatever, right? They had a whole bunch of infrastructure there. They had farming, they had all this other stuff that they, they can base their society off of. But when you go to a new place and you don't have that, you have to start all the way from scratch, right? And so in order to quickly get up to the point they have, they, they, they are used to living in, they have to grow fast. And what's the best way to grow fast? Automate, have somebody else do it, right? And that's what they did. That's the whole point of slavery, right? It was for viral growth, okay? And yes, there were other aspects in there. Like once again, supremacy, um, the idea of imperial, imperialism, the idea of religion and all this other stuff, that played a factor into it. But you have to realize that even with imperialism, I mean, even with um, like religion and wanting to spread your 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 colony, right? Your your um, your imperial, your uh, what you? Oh my gosh! <laughs> spread your empire somewhere else. It doesn't require you to grow that fast, right? It doesn't require you to. And if you want to spread your colony, you don't have to grow super fast. Like if you played a, if you ever played a, you know, um, strategy game, if you ever played. Um, any of these video games out there, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. 
Um, if you don't believe in video games, if you don't want to, <laughs> you know, see that as bad, just radical as a valid thing, just realize that when you when you're growing somewhere, when you go to a new new lands and you want to establish your your colony or something like that, right? It just requires you to plant your flag or you know begin to and begin to build there. You know, begin to have your people, you know, put up your log cabins, or whatever, you know, st start to figure out what you can eat there. Like none of that requires you to grow super fast. The only reason why you would grow super fast is if you want to quickly get up to the, 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 the point when you can compete with the other people, with other people that's trying to take lands and stuff like that, right? So this viral growth and this competition, um, they feed off of each other. Right. And that creates that creates the incentive for things like slavery. That creates the incentive for things like extractive economies, for things like where you take away from the, the, the natural environment and put it all in your own territory, your quote unquote territory, so that you can grow faster than the, the competition, faster than other people can catch up with you. And if you look at so if you look at today, you see the same type of ideals, right? With tech companies, that's the same ideals. Where you, <laughs> you're trying to automate, you're trying to get all this data from people, right? You, you're trying to, <laughs> you're basically, <laughs> I don't want to, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to do it anyways, but like the way that data is being used today is almost like, almost, not literally, but metaphorically in some sense, kind of like slavery, right? In terms of the fact that you're abusing somebody else's labor, somebody else's ideas, somebody else's data or somebody else's, you know, um, intrinsic value, or whatever, for your own purposes. And you're trying to aggregate all of that into your, into your own colony, into your own empire, right? Your own business. And um, Again, I know it's not exact, it's not slavery, it's not nothing like that. You're not literally abusing people, <laughs> um, at least not directly. But the point is that you have an extractive economy where you're trying to take the data, you're trying to take resources, take processing power, take you know, server space, take all this whatever from other people or create it from your create it based on um by taking raw resources, creating new computers and all this other stuff, right? It's still an extractive economy. It incentivizes you to take shortcuts. It incentivizes you to um, honestly abuse the environment. Because if you're trying to grow fast, that has to come at the sacrifice of something. You can't just you can't just wave a magic wand and just you know do whatever you want to do. You have to take those resources from somewhere else it's inherent in the, the, the process of growing fast. It's inherent. It's a natural sacrifice that you have to make. And so the price of growth to me is the environment. That environment can, can, encompass, can include people, can include resources such as you know, the, the nature, such as the, the minerals within the earth trees, animals, all these things. In order for you to have fast growth, you have to extract it from somewhere else unsustainably. And I say unsustainably because sustainability takes time. Sustainability takes time for recycling, for the cycle to re, you know, re refurbish itself, to re replenish itself. I don't think there's anywhere on this earth where you can take something and then the next day it replenishes as just just where it was before, right? Without any sort of problems. I don't think there's anywhere on this earth that does that. And we're taking things far faster than, you know, just <laughs> than just a day uh, in terms of turnaround and stuff like that. So I'm not sure if this 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 if this is uh once again visualized well enough, but I think it's very important to realize you know the price of growth, the price of um, big companies and things like that. So since I'm already on this topic, 
when you talk about Google, things, big company like Google, I'm going to say Google because that's been on my mind. I just read a, I just listened to a podcast called Land of the Giants where they're going through Google. And because with Google, I don't think it's a clear case. With other companies like Facebook, you can say, oh, I don't know if there's, if they really changed the world for the better, right? <laughs> I don't know. But with Google, you, it's, 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 you know, you can, you can say, you can make a good case that Google has changed the world for the better, right? They've, I know I'm not going to say they accomplished their mission of of of, of uh, organizing the world's information, but they certainly did make it far easier than ever before to um, get access to information, right? And that's a huge boon that created a whole lot of innovation and progress and growth and all this other stuff, right? Um, YouTube, Google Drive, Maps, all this stuff has is made are, are amazing, amazing. But you have to ask, <laughs> you have to wonder, what are the cons? At what cost did some of that come, come into, right? For instance, with Google search, the simplest thing that the, their fundamental business, Google search. Why is it that it is just as easy to find fake facts, to find alternative facts, to find lies and, and crap as it is to find real information? If their purpose was to organize the world's information, wouldn't it also be sensible to make sure that information is actually well organized? When you Google, it's not necessarily well organized. It's, it's kind of a, a, a waterfall, a, a, a <laughs> deluge of stuff that comes up whenever you Google anything. You don't really know what is fact, what is fiction. You don't really know you know, just by looking at it, you know, what has been verified is validated, you know, what is good science, for instance, and what is not, you don't really know any of that. I'm not going to get into why it's gotten that way, you know, because that goes into a whole other, you know, topics, but just looking at it at face value, um, you really have to take note of that, because that is a huge, huge red flag, right? Because when we, we look at today, we have record high numbers of um, disparity of, of, of division, right? You have extremism and all this other stuff. And you have to wonder like if, if Google was meant to organize the world's information and make it easier to get access to you know, information and stuff like that, then why is it that, <laughs> to knowledge rather, then why is it that people aren't more knowledgeable than they were before? Yeah, some people are, some people are like, oh yeah, you know, uh, my mom said nobody went to the moon, but I can Google, you know, <laughs> the, the moon landing and stuff like that. But when you Google the moon landing, you can also, you know, see uh, search results from like conspiracy theorists who like, oh, they didn't go. Here's, this is fake. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Why is there no filters or no like um, design, you, no UI designs that shows you, hey, this is like this is like validated by x amount of science you know scientific facts this is not right this is made by a, a a person just sitting around somewhere just coming up with stuff and this is made by a peer-reviewed science group or whatever right like why don't we have any of that <laughs> right if, if if your job was to if your goal was to organize information would you organize it like google did like google did with their search engine like ugh, it's don't get me wrong. It's amazing. It's amazing that we were able to, that they were able to, and still are able to, you know, take all this information that was in books and all this other stuff and make it accessible on the web. And yes, there are, I, I do recognize that there is, you know, academic search, uh, you can search, you know, with scholar or whatever and all that other stuff, but still stands that when the average person Google something, they're not necessarily met with organized information. They're met with accessible information. And it's only quasi accessible because you're, once you like, we all know, like you don't, most people don't go past the first page of Google. You know, it's very rare that you ever go into the 10,000th page of Google and there's, you know, they could be 10,000 pages. That's the whole point of the name Google, <laughs> right? <laughs> A Google all of information. Um, an un, un, unsurmountable, uncountable, right, right, number of stuff, hundred million, billion, billion, whatever, 
is a term of search results. And most people don't look at all those results. Most people only look at the first page, maybe the two, second, third. If you really going crazy, you might get to the fifth page, but nobody's going to the 10th. Nobody's going to the 20th, the 100th, the 1000th, right? And so is that really organized? Is that really organized? That's questions for you to, 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 to ask and to think about. So when, when we talk about, you know, how, how much Google and these other big tech companies have changed the world, has it really been for the better? Where's the spreadsheet that shows, you know, the good that Google and Facebook and all these companies have done in the bad? Can we make a let's 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 bring that together. Let's organize that information and and use that to make a informed decision on where we should be moving towards in the future. Because we're coming up, we're, we're having more and more technology that is affecting more of our daily lives. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and go. I'm, I can go on forever with this, but <laughs> to get into the next part of uh, data, you know, terms of service, when you're looking at terms of service, privacy policies, uh, data collection, and so on and so forth. What is the, again, the, the cost of that, the price of that data? So I was thinking about this earlier. I was thinking about what if somebody said, I'm going to give you some money. I'm going to give you access to, you know, a whole bunch of cool stuff but in order to do that you're gonna have to uh dig in dig around your house dig some holes up go in your couch pocket and your couch and all the other, other stuff go in your your beehive out there your your toilet your trash all this stuff <laughs> you have to take all that together and, and give it to me in order for me to provide you this service you know like what i'm not gonna do that that's that's crazy but if somebody says i'll do this for you i'm gonna dig in your trash I'm going to, you know, look in your lawn. I'm going to, you know, go look in your toilet and all this other stuff. And I'm going to be able to save you, you know, $1,000, $10,000, maybe even $100,000. You'd be like, all right, that, that sounds good. I might, I might want to do that, <laughs> right? Um, and that's a lot of what, you know, technology does in terms of being able to surface value being able to surface opportunities, being able to surface data from a whole bunch of disparate stuff, right? It's very important to realize that, you know, a lot of our technology, a lot of our data, big data collection is very valuable. It's very amazing stuff that we can do with this, with this um, information. However, what if I said, okay, I want to give you a service now where um, you can post things on your wall, <laughs> right? where you're in your house, you, whenever you do, you're cooking food or whatever, right? You can, I'll take a picture for you and put it on your wall. And then if you want to share that with other people, like on your physical wall, I'm not, I'm just, I wanna make it super physical. So it's very easy for all of us to visualize. So, you know, I'm gonna take a professional photo for you. I'm gonna put it on your wall so you can have it and you can always remember, you know, what you did that day, um, what you cooked that day, whatever. And if you want, you can share with other people. If you want to share, I'll make a copy for you. And then I'll run it over to your neighbor. I'll run it over to your mom, to your partner, to your sister, to whatever, to your friends. You know, I even go across country for you. That sounds amazing. That sounds like an amazing service, right? And I say, guess what? It's free. That's why you don't have to pay anything for me to do this. I'll do this. I'll do this for you. And you're like, what? That is amazing service. Okay, let's go. Let's get it, right? But what if they say in order for them to do that, they have to sit in your house and watch you for 10 hours, 12 hours, 24 seven. They have to sit in your house and watch you. At first they'd be like, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be you know, in the living room for you know, four or five hours of the day. And you're like, I guess it's an amazing service. You know, it's free. Four to five hours, you know, just sitting in the living room watching me. And then when I say take a picture, you take a picture. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's do that. All right. A lot of people will probably might might do something like that. All right. But then they say, oh, I can't really see you when you're in the kitchen. I can't really hear you that well. So I need to follow you into the kitchen too. I'm like, oh, okay, I, I, I guess, you know. Oh, I know I said four or five hours, but 
I miss a lot. You know, you miss a lot when I'm not here. And you might have some great moments, like your your son. You know, they got their first steps, and you couldn't you couldn't take a picture of that because you you know you were in the moment. If I was there, I could have took a picture for you, right? So I'm like, oh, okay. All right, you might want to be there a little bit longer, maybe ten hours of the day, right? Taking all these pictures, making sure you have all this amazing stuff on your wall. You can share with your family, share those first steps with your family, stuff like that. It's amazing. And say, okay, okay, fine. So I went from four or five hours to 10 hours, following you around in your living room and your kitchen. But you can quickly see where I'm going with this. Like, okay, I miss, uh, you miss, you miss quite a bit of stuff when you was in the, when you was in your bedroom. You know, I saw, you know, you was probably working. You have your office in there and stuff like that. So maybe I need to follow you in there too. And, you know, again, you can, you can tell me when I, when to take a picture, when to not take a picture. Um, but I, I might need to follow you in there too. I'm like, I don't know, man. I'm like, I'm not going to be there the whole time. I can peek in. I can be at the door and peek in, you know. So quickly, but obviously, you know, it can quickly, you know, get get worse. So they might say, okay, fine. You can go come into my bedroom, you know, see when I'm when I'm working in my office, or if you have a separate office room, whatever. Same same thing. And then they say, oh, I need to I need to see why you sleep, you know. I need to be there while you sleep because, you know, I need to track your sleeping. You can slap your track your sleeping habits to see, you know, if you're sleeping the whole night, you know, <laughs> and your, your mom want to see if you still snored or not, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you can come up with any reason why, you know, this is, this could be a valuable service to you. And some people be like, oh yeah, I guess it's free to whatever. And they start doing that too. And then, you know, they're saying, you got to go in the bathroom. Let me see you in the bathroom. I have to see you in the bathroom. I have to make sure that you're safe. I have to make sure that, you know, <laughs> using the bathroom well, that you know, you're not gonna fall while you're in the shower or something like that. I have to see you while you're in the bathroom. So you quickly see where I'm going here. Like you get the surveillance of somebody or a group of people following you around, you around your home, watching everything you do. And guess what? All that time, they didn't tell you. They were actually recording the whole thing. Not just when you told them to, but also when you didn't. Because they, because you know, they had to make sure that they can catch things, you know, just in case they cut, just in case there was a really amazing moment and you didn't, you know, you didn't know, you didn't, you didn't remember to tell them to take a picture. They had to, you know, they had to justify it. That's how they justified it. And you was like, ah, blah, blah, blah. So the point is here <laughs> that in real, even in real life, like you can kind of come up with an idea that, that people can offer you as amazing service. But that quickly, you know, comes at the cost of your privacy, of all this other stuff. And it's very obvious when it's in real life. Like when, as I was talking about this, you may have been thinking, ah, oh, I wouldn't allow that. I wouldn't blah, blah, blah. And maybe some of us be like, oh yeah, maybe I would, right? Privacy is, a, is whatever. Privacy is made up, right? It doesn't really matter. But the point here is that in real life, it's easy to see, you know, that difference. It's easy to see this is weird right? This is kind of crazy, right? And if and to really drive this home, that scenario gets crazy when you, when you recognize the fact that that people, the, the people who were giving you the service, they made like a million dollars off of it. Not by selling it to your mom or selling it to this, but they t take that service and sell it to Walmart, to Target, to you know, the government or some other government or whatever, and they they <laughs> paid so that they can give you advertisements. They can when you watch TV, you can see more targeted commercials, right? When you <laughs> when you go to to the library, you can see books that were recommended for you based on you know all this data people got when they were in your house looking at you twenty four seven. When you go to the store, that Walmart can show you the stuff that's in your cabinet based on when people are looking at you, right? That's how they made their money. They made a million dollars off of you and you didn't get a cut. Is that still okay? It's a free service, right? That's the idea, that, that's the way that we need to be thinking about this stuff, right? Is that just because it's free, just because it's just advertisements, doesn't mean it's okay, all right? And there's an incredible amount of value that is being exchanged 
behind our backs that nobody is telling telling you of. Nobody's making it clear, you know, how much how much data they're taking, where they're looking at you at. And I, I pointed this out because you know, at home you can tell somebody's in your house, you can tell somebody's in your room looking at you, but you can't tell that on your on the computer. People are following you everywhere on the computer, right? These companies are able to follow whenever you type into Google or type in a thing, and they, they have these APIs where they tell around that like cookies that's the whole point of these these cookies is that when you go into a website that cache data that information that you visit this website on this website you click this you looked at this you were here for this amount of time that information gets sent back to facebook gets sent to google gets sent to you know these advertisements and that's how they make their money and we like to say sorry my lips are chapped <laughs> and we like to say um Oh yeah, that's fine. It's just advertisements. It's just data, right? It's, we only say that's okay. We don't. We we're not up in arms about this stuff because we don't actually see it happening. And humans, we're very visual creatures. We're very see it to believe it. And um, sorry, forty five minutes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll try to wrap this up, but. <laughs> This is the things that these are the things that I'm talking about that I'm thinking about because I am a person who wants to change the world for the better. I want to create amazing technologies and amazing tools for people to live better lives. But I'm really, really, really thinking about what what's the cost, right? What am I willing to sacrifice or not sacrifice? Like what what's what's the line that I'm willing to draw for my ethics and my morals? In, in the in the in the name of more money or in the name of more growth in the name of more scalability in the name of better business i really i'm thinking about these things because i really think it's important and every decade every year that we progress that we grow with our technology the 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 impact that technology has on our lives also grows like many of us can't even imagine what it will be like to not use google to not use any google products no google chrome no google search no maps no drive no domains no i don't know they probably have some sort of apis that we don't we don't reckon realize they use right and it's worrying because if we can't imagine our lives without them, then it's, it's, it's that much easier to justify all the things that they do that are abusive, that are unethical. And I don't want to go down that line as I'm building my own business, right? I don't want to go into that territory. And I really think heavily about these things because I really want to be at that scale. I want to be at the scale where I can impact the lives of billions of people, where my product is being used by a billion people or more. But I want my product to be helping them. And I don't want that help to come at the cost of their agency. I don't want that help to come at the cost of their knowledge of their access to valid valid information right i don't want to be selling their data to who knows who for who knows what it just doesn't feel right to me and furthermore i don't think it's right i don't think it's i don't think it's good in the long run it's not just a matter of feeling it's also a matter of the fact that when you create a system where you're selling information to other people, to third parties, you're incentivized to quality to to you're incentivized to um, what do you call it? To oh my gosh, to justify you know anything that can make their the third parties um, experience better at the expense of the consumers at the expense of the people that you're getting data from. If you're, I mean, this is, this is common business, right? If you're, if your customers, like you pay attention to your paying customers, the people who pay 
for the service, the people who pay your paycheck, right? The people who make it possible for you to live, to exist, you're going to want to give them a better service. But if the people who are actually paying for the service are not the people who are actually using the service, then what does that mean? Like, how does that affect the incentives? We like to think that, you know, of course, people will still want to improve the, the quality of service for, you know, consumers, because if nobody's using the product, then they can't get the data and they can't sell their data. But that's a that's a like a step down. That's less efficient, right? That's abstraction. Whenever you have that abstraction from, once again, the, the decision maker and the, the, the person doing the work, you have less efficiency in the system and you have more inequality in the system. It's just, just common fact. And we can see this over 150,000 years of history or rather 10,000 years of you know um, agricultural history, right? We can see this. And so when I create a business, when you see, or anybody creates a business and they're using information they're 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 or rather they're trying to what they're, they're, they're basically have one customer which is the ad buyer or the ad you know seller whatever right they have one customer is the ad people and the other customer is the people you're getting data from you're going to customize you know the bulk of your experiences for that ad person for the person that's paying you for all that stuff and you're only going to you know somewhat look at you know the consumers the people that you're getting data from just enough that they stay on the platform. And I don't think that's a good experience. I don't think that's, that makes for the most innovative products, the most impactful products, the most right beneficial products that we can have. Because if Google was actually beholden to the consumers or any company, right? But I'm using Google because I was already using that. If, if the, Google actually cared about the consumer, the user experience, then they would probably have realized that you need to design a search engine that also is able to, you know, have some simple things that says, this is validated, this is not, this comes from this source, this, right? You can, this is a user experience problem. This is a design issue. It's only so much engineering you can do in order to increase the experience. You have to have people thinking about you know, what makes a the better experience, not just how to make this more efficient or how to make this, you know, how to have more features. You need to be thinking about how to make that user's experience better. And if Google really cared about the user experience of the user, then they would be able to design something that made this whole idea of alternative facts and, and fake information, all this stuff, that would be none and void. That would be none and void. Like if you just think about it, if Google is almost is over 20 years old now and they have the exact same search engine feature, like the exact same search engine. I mean, not exactly like obviously, but the general gist of it, right, is pretty much the same. You Google and you get data, you get information, you get search results. Um, the main thing they've changed since then is making like maybe the titles bigger, description smaller, you have cards and all that stuff. But each of those steps was not necessarily better for the user, at least not holistically. That's another aspect, right? Is people say, oh, it's better because I have this chip. Like when you Google uh, um, a song, right? A song lyric, it will show you some of the lyrics right there. You don't even have to click into anything. It shows you right there. That, that seems to be better user experience, right? But where do those, you know, lyrics come from? Here's a better example. Um, cooking, right? Um, when you Google something, it has, may, may have some cooking information or, you know what I'm talking about, those, those uh, search results where you, we have like an accordion, clicks into you and it gives you the answer even before, you don't have to click into the website, right? The website is the one, is, is, is because you don't have to click into the website, the people in the website are not getting any ad revenue. And so the people who created that information for you to know, for you to, you know, to, to educate yourself with are not actually getting the revenue 
for you to when you when you went into their website, since you are able to see that at the beginning. And so if Google really cared about the user experience, they would be thinking about holistically the experience of the, the, the target audience. Like there's different user groups going on here. There's a user group of people who are typing things in and Googling and trying to find information. There's a user group of people who are who have who are making things online, content creators, you know, bloggers, science even scientific articles, right? And are putting that information online for, for it to be read. And then there's also the, the consumer group of the, the advertisers, of course, right? All of these are different users. And the experience for each of them is different. The experience for each of them is also not ideal, right? Even for advertisers, like the, the portal for, for um, putting your ad up there on Google for, for ranking your, your site and all that stuff. Oh my, that portal is crazy. There's a lot of stuff in there. But it's very difficult to figure out, you know, <laughs> how, to, how to go through that portal. Um, once again, that's a user experience problem. They should be thinking about that. But also, I'm looking at this in terms of, this, of the, the, the fact that these people who are making advertisements can see so much more information than the person who is, who is, um, Googling than the person who was just looking up information online. That seems like a simple thing or, or like an obvious thing because the pe person is advertising has a lot of information they, they have to get out there, but it's not because once again, the person that's Googling is looking, is not just looking for any information. They're looking for the right information, right? Good knowledge. They're looking for validated information. Because Google doesn't really care about that aspect too much, like that's not their main customer they're looking at, that, that degrades the experience such that when you look online, you're just as easy, you're just as easy to find false information, to find out of date information, to find, you know, fake stuff than you are to find real stuff, to find good information, to find this, that, and the other. And so... I think that's that's very worrying. That's very there's a lot of there's a lot of issues with that. I've been on it a long this <laughs> an hour now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I need to be I need to learn how to be more concise. But um yeah, this these are just the things I'm thinking about. Cuz I'm trying to create a, a a platform that curates the world's knowledge. So it's easy for you to find the right size of the type of information. And so I'm thinking about okay, you know, when you find that information, how do you know it's va ver is validated? How you know it's verified? How you know it's good information, right? So I need to figure that out. And then um, that validation process, what is that validation process like, right? Who can validate who, who's doing the validation? You know, how do you know that verification process is, is good? So on and so forth. And um, I think these are very important things to think about not just at this point in, in, the, in the process, but at every stage. So to kind of recap <laughs> a little bit, um, in terms of data, in terms of the price of growth, we really need to make a, a, a balance sheet, balance spreadsheet about the pros and cons of these things, right? And um, really see is, is, it, is it really, you know, are we really progressing as much as we think we are? I think making that sort of that sort of data visualization, that sort of you know spreadsheet, will make it far easier to determine um, everything from regulations to technology te technology progress to you know big tech, like how to make companies or what type of companies to to make, what type of companies to invest in, you know what it means to make a better world, and um, the responsibility of entrepreneurs, the responsibility of employees in tech, the responsibilities of um, investors, all that stuff. I'm really thinking about that stuff because we just can't keep going on like this. We can't keep, you know, just doing it just because it's, 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 it's growth, it's, va it's, it's perceived value, it's perceived um, progress and stuff like that. Because sooner or later, and we already see it happening pretty soon, you know, you're gonna have cut. You're gonna have a lot of repercussions. 
see, we don't have to, I don't have to go into all this stuff, all the problems that we have today in our society. So just, just, just consider that, man. Like if you're an entrepreneur, if you're, if you're a tech employee, if you're an investor, whatever, really think about <laughs> what are the impacts you're, you're, you're doing here? Like what are the, the, um, the consequences of, of the actions that you're taking and the things that you're involved in, like really, like really sit down and think about it and do some research. Anyways, probably should end it there, but I want to keep talking. I really want to talk about um, emergent intelligence as well. And this is kind of just my working name for this idea, this kind of vague concept I have in my mind of, can we make more efficient AI, artificial intelligence, by focusing on making cleaner data or, you know, better component systems that work together more efficiently, that are interoperable, interoperable, whatever, that, that work together, you know, more cohesively, that are able to, to come together and from that cohesion, create more complexity through emergence. So a good way to think about this is water. Um, I believe I've talked about this before, but water is really amazing, right? It's super simple, H2O, you know, just two hydrogen atoms, one oxygen atom bonded together. And it's dumb simple, right? And then when you put a whole bunch of these atoms together, you get a little water droplet. You get a little water molecule, right? Um, and then when you put a whole bunch of those together, you get like, like a handful of water, and you can do different things like you can put it if you have a cup of water right it does a lot of amazing things just 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 a cup of water is pretty amazing you have to drink it you know drink some water and it's and it does amazing things to your body um based on you know evolution based on how it interacts with all the things in your body right just at that level alone you have an amazing amount of emergence because of the way that water molecules bound, bond together the way that they bond together with themselves and with other, you know, um, molecules with other atoms, that that simplicity creates an emergent factor, a, a a levels of emergence that are extremely complicated, in and of uh, just just by the basis of their simplicity, right? And I'm not sure if I'm making sense with this here, but it just to me it seems like well before i get to that let, let's let's continue this this um visualization so yeah you have a cup of water you can drink that water it does amazing things to your body hydrates you right because it goes because the water molecules once again goes down to each one of these you know different cells in your body and, and it i don't want to go through all that but it helps your body right that's just with a cup of water if you if you go further with this, you, you have more water and eventually you get to a, a pond, right? And in that pond, things can live in there, right? You can have these little uh, bacteria, little insects living in there, right? Um, unfortunately, flies, right, can plant, can plant their eggs in there. And, you know, we like to poo-poo on mosquitoes and flies, but a lot of, you know, these things are good for, for nature um, because of other animals eat those things, right? And other things can, you know, put their eggs in the, in the little pond, a little standing pond. Very simple, but super complicated, once again, because you have a pond that's standing, but because of the, 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 the fundamental nature of water, the water molecules and, and uh, things that's in there, right, other creatures interact with that, that pond of water. And because other creatures interact with that pond of water, it creates a, a complexity that is far, far more advanced than most of us can truly realize, can truly understand, can can intuit. And once you can, you know, get that bigger, eventually you get to a whole lake, get to a lake where you have fishes in there. You can have, you know, a lake of any size, different sizes have different amounts of animals in there. You can have, you know, fish, you can have turtles, you can have goose, geese, whatever, ducks, all these, all these things, right, can live in that water. And because of that, you, you have an ecosystem now. Um, I mean, I guess before you kind of had one, a micro ecosystem, but with this, you really have an ecosystem. 
a whole bunch of different animals are living there and those are interacting with other things and the water is interacting with the with the, the earth the ground underneath it around it you know um, um giving nutrition to the to the to the the leaves i mean the um grass and the bushes around it right things can grow around it and things can then live in those right so it, it, just the simple thing the simple water molecule just all it does is just ad adhere cohere whatever to other water molecules and it just grows and grows and grows and because it's so simple and because it's so interactive so interoperable it creates all these complex systems and that's just at that level. Now, if you go further, you can have rivers, right? That has, that has all, I don't have to explain all that stuff. You get it now. You have rivers and then you have, you, eventually you have ocean. You have an ocean where all of life started on this earth, started in the ocean, right? And then you have the water cycle. You have evaporation and condensation. You have, oh, this is amazing stuff, right? Just from this simple molecule. Like it just blows my mind when you really think about the complexity that is able to emerge from this comp from this simple little molecule. And I didn't even go into everything else. Like that's just the ecosystem, right? The water itself has complex emergent factors at each level, right? The water molecules, you know, from a little droplet of water can connect to different things. Like if I, you know, spray my plants, if I have some air plants up here, you can't see it, but like, like that one. <laughs> if I spray, right, it will be a water droplet that is able to like just stand there for a second, right? And just looking at this, it, it's really cool, it's really amazing, but the way light reflects off of it, the way the plant sucks it in eventually, right? Or it might drop down and evaporate and, um, or again to my clothes and stuff like that, right? That water droplet, is is emergent factors, emergent complexity that comes from a number of, of water molecules, you know, adhering to each other, coherent, whatever the damn term is, coming together um, at that level. And then once you get bigger into a cup of water, right, you can swirl it around. You hear you can swirl around this cup, stuff like that. Um, it's kind of empty now. If I drip it, <laughs> right, it could do. If it, if it if I drip it over my laptop, it would do some damage. But that, there's you know inherent complexity in this just just in this cup of water the fact that you can swirl it around you can't swirl a droplet of water around right but it's it's emergent complexity once again getting bigger if you go to a pond if you go to a lake right it has ripples in the water if you drop something in there you see ripples in the water and if you you can stare just just try this one it just drop something in the water and just stare at it like it's it's amazing to look at right that's an emergent complexity that is not found in, in, in you know, smaller things like that. You can't really, it's very hard to have ripples in a, in a cup of water. You can, but it's not the same effect as a giant lake of water, you know, rippling. And the fact that the giant lake of water can reflect the sky and the, cl and the, the clouds and the, you know, trees around it and all this other stuff. And, and looking at that has, is just really beautiful. It has this beauty to it that is unique to that level, that that scale. And then that scale is bigger to, you know, you know, rivers have a certain other complexity to the to the way the water moves. The fact that the water moves, you know, through the land, you know, by gravity, whatever, um, that has its own unique properties. And then once again to the ocean has a whole bunch of other properties. Like these ripples are not ripples anymore, they're waves, right? And the waves are can create tidal waves and you have these current underwater currents and that creates you know um storms right like a lot of the storms comes from the way the water moves in the ocean and the way that evaporates over land and all this other stuff right all this amazing complexity super complex stuff that we still can't fully understand or predict or or even simulate correctly right from this simple water molecules from these simple things. So <laughs> I, I took my time to explain all that because I wonder, can we create, is that the secret of intelligence? 
of artificial intelligence, of any intelligence, because our brains are the same thing, right? Our brains, and I don't ascribe to the belief that our brains come from nowhere or some, you know, magical beings like, oh, here's your intelligence right now. I think it's, I think it's the same aspects of, of what we see in nature, just like with water, with, you know, combines and combines, it just gets bigger and more complex. I think it's the same thing in our minds, in our brains, right? We have these atoms in our brains and they combine and they cohere and they, I don't know how it works exactly, but I, I read a, read and see a lot of stuff about, you know, neurochemistry. And it's amazing that all this stuff is just simple dendrites and simple electrons, you know, going back simple chemicals, you know, communicating with itself and it creates this amazing intelligence that we have and that we can, you can hear me talk to me we can create stuff and all this other it's it's just it's just you're really amazing right and and so i wonder can we replicate that is that the secret of creating intelligence like why are we trying to create artificial intelligence by trying to create rules of you know how something should work and then making it learn by you know and blah 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 and it's like that's not how nature works Right. That's. I don't think that's how our intelligence came to be. I think we it came from a simple thing that is just able to, you know, collect and scale and go bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and, bigger. and you know, it, it 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 works differently in different environments, and it's interruptible. Right, <laughs> it is able to you know work with a number of creatures and number of things and very diverse in nature and very diverse in, in the structure and stuff like that almost every single thing if you look at trees if you look at you know um rocks right any of these things it's the same concept and that's what i want to create i wonder i want i want to try and create an, an intelligence an artificial intelligence that is just an emergent factor and i think the secret to that is creating really simple data sets really simple molecules atoms right digital atoms that are really just these simple components and are able to you know build upon each other and are able to interact with other things very quick very easily very simply um all these simple rules it's not even a rule really it's just <laughs> it's just a factor of the property of the, uh, the property of of the thing it's just how it reacts to others so that's my idea of uh, emergent technology, emergent intelligence. And um, that's something I really want to get into one day. But it's something that goes in my mind, you know, kind of in the background. Um, so yeah, it's probably in this here. I didn't really get too much into other stuff. But uh, I talked about a lot. I talked about a lot so far. So uh, hopefully that is enough for, uh, for you to think about. Um, as always, if you want to, you know, have a discussion with me if you want to you know uh share your own ideas or um tell me how 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 much how, how much i'm wrong oh real, real quick just because i did mention the fact that water is amazing because it scales really quickly we have to realize that with humans and with the things that we do we also scale very quickly right and and i i recognize that earlier my talk about growth and the price of growth can be seen as I'm like trying to poo poo this idea of growth and progress and all this other stuff. I'm not obviously, but the fact that I just went on like five minutes talking about water scaling, right? I, I do think there is inherent value in the ability to scale. However, because we are self aware, right? We're not water molecules that, as far as we know, don't have any sort of self awareness of how they scale and where they scale and all this other stuff, right? Like a the ocean will just as easily swamp through an entire area and kill everything there, right? It's, it doesn't, it doesn't really choose, you know, how it moves and what it does, but we do, okay? We can choose what we do. We can choose how we scale and when we scale and where and so on and so forth. And I think that with that knowledge comes the responsibility, comes an inherent responsibility ethics right around considering whether or not like this is a good way of scaling because other things scale very quickly too right like i said before in the last video a lot of, like we get this name of viral growth from viruses viruses scale the can scale very quickly but that comes at the cost of the host it kills the host 
And so if we are, you know, scaling very quickly, we have to ask ourselves, does that come at the cost of our host, of the earth, right, of our society? Does that, will that kill the earth? Will that kill our society? Will that kill democracy? Will that kill, you know, equality, so on and so forth? There's other plants, for instance, when um, a, a, another big factor of, of, of this scale scaling issue is the ecosystem as a fact that we don't really consider the ecosystem, the environment as much as we should, which is really silly because we know for a fact that if we move a plant, for instance, the kudzu, right? So it's a home of in, I don't know, Japan, I think I might, I might be wrong about that. Sorry, but it's a home of some other place. Right. And when people brought it here because they thought it looked pretty, whatever, they brought it here and then boom, it, just, it started going crazy. So I mean, I'm here in Georgia and you can go down when you you can get on the highway, you will see kudzu everywhere. Right. It kills a lot of the growth, the, <laughs> the undergrowth or the overgrowth or whatever uh, along the highway system. Like you can see everywhere. They have to cut it constantly. You have to keep cutting it constantly so it doesn't overtake everything else. Right. And, be, and that's because it got taken out of its original ecosystem where it had natural um, um, competition, right? It had natural predators and prey where other things will take eat that thing up and it will eat others up and this that and that, this that and that, whatever, right? But when we when we brought it over here, all that was gone. It didn't have predators. It didn't have you know competition or anything like that. And that created a invasive species. Right. And so we as humans, we have to think about when we're bringing a system from our minds into some other place, from this place into from this market to another market, from, you know, um, this point in history to another whatever. Like, is it what is the cost of that? Like, again, what is the cost of that? Like, what is going to happen to the environment? What is going to happen to the ecosystem that we are trying to grow into? Are we going to become an invasive species? And because we are self-aware, we're, we're sentient creatures, it is our responsibility to think about these things, is to consider these things. So anyways, I, I just had to make sure I, I made that made that clear. I, I, I do value growth and I think think that growth and, pro growth and progress and all these things is a, is a, can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing, right? And we have to consider these things. And I don't see those considerations enough i don't see enough people talking about you know what is the what is the price like if we grow this company you know this amount in this time of year what is that going to do to the ecosystem what is that going to do to the environment what is that going to do to the marketplace right we don't have that consideration we just say oh disruption yay but you know virus is disruptive the kudzu that invasive species is disruptive disruption isn't always good so yeah, we need to, I know people do talk about disruption, but not really to that extent. Like as people, as entrepreneurs, as employees at these businesses, even if we're early in this case, like I am, even if you're just early getting in there, you still have to think about these things because you're going to be living on this earth, right? You're living in this system. You're living in society and you are a sentient creature. You're not just... The, the, the main thing that differentiates us from other animals is the fact that we can think. We can think ahead, right? We can try to predict the future. We can socialize with each other, th these types of things. And if, we, if, we, if, you, if you see yourself working at these companies or building these companies or whatever, and you don't think it's your responsibility to think about the impact that will have, good and bad, if you don't think about, you know, cost of that growth the price if you're invasive species if you're you know um if you're like an actual virus because your viral growth is actually a virus right if you're not thinking about these things then you might as well just be another animal right you might as well just <laughs> right it's just ah i think it's just so irresponsible so stupid quite frankly to not think about these things so um yeah anyways <laughs> thanks again for listening for watching and um Ooh, I'm going to go make me some bun on some uh, planting and uh, yeah. See you. Bye bye.